Good evening. I'm Mark Updegrove, the director of the LBJ Library. Welcome to our Harry Middleton lecture featuring Dr. Douglas Brinkley. Before I introduce Doug, I just want to say a, a thing or two about the Harry Middleton lecture. Anyone who knows the LBJ Library knows Harry Middleton. He was director here for over 30 years, which frankly is a little humbling to me. Um, he left uh, a mark on this institution and indeed on the institution of presidential libraries that will long endure. President and Mrs. Johnson certainly believed that and in his honor for all that he did for this institution and for them, they endowed the Harry Middleton Lecture. And over the years, this lecture has featured everyone from former presidents, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, to journalists, Bill Moyers, Brian Williams, Tom Brokaw, to playwrights, David Mamet. We continue the tradition of bringing renowned minds to this stage by welcoming Doug Brinkley tonight. Doug was described by fellow historian Stephen Ambrose as being the best of the new generation of American historians. He's written a staggering number of books. Again, for an author like me, that also is very humbling. His books have included The Great Deluge, Tour of Duty, John Kerry and the Vietnam War, The Boys of Point de Hoc, the, and The Unfinished Presidency, Jimmy Carter's Journey Beyond the White House, as well as editing books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Reagan Diaries. His newest book, Wilderness Warrior, is on Theodore Roosevelt as a conservationist visionary. And he'll talk a little bit about that this evening. As if that weren't enough writing, Doug also finds time to write for Vanity Fair, American Heritage, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic Monthly, and The New York Times. Doug has a long and esteemed career in academia and is currently serving as a professor of history and Baker Institute fellow at Rice Institute in Houston, though he and his wife, Anne, and their two boys are locals here in Austin. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Doug Brinkley. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Well, I'm here today for one reason, and it's not LBJ per se, but Harry. And thank you, um, you know, for, for doing so much that you've done over the years, and it's a great honor to be here. And the topic today is quite fitting to be speaking with Lyndon Johnson, um, which is conservation. Um, before I get into my, my talk on Theodore Roosevelt, I wanted you to just keep in mind that when LBJ was president, he did more for conservation. Actually, National Geographic called him our great conservation president, Lyndon Johnson. But most people put him as a bookend of the 20th century with Theodore Roosevelt and then LBJ, who did so much to promote public lands in America. Lyndon Johnson created 35 national parks, 32 of those within easy driving range of cities. And in the, he, he is the person who signed the 1968 Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, which today protects 165 river segments in 38 states in Puerto Rico. He's the one who formed the National Trail System Act and established more than 1,000 recreation, scenic, and historic trails. LBJ cared deeply about the land, as you all know. It began for him in the, the Texas Hill Country. But there's one story I wanted to tell Johnson, and, and um, before I get into TR, and that's with Stuart Udall, his interior secretary. And Stuart Udall and Lady Bird Johnson worked as an incredible um, tandem team, not just for highway beautification, but for lands policy and clean air, clean water. And there's a story I might have slightly wrong, but um, Stuart Udall's in his 90s today, and he tells that he lives in Santa Fe. And he's, he can't see um, Mr. Udall, but he's, his mind is incredibly um, um, 
together, and he has a great memory, and he's a wonderful rank and tour. And it's the time that the part of the Great Lakes in the 60s were on fire from pollution. And Johnson got on the phone and called Udall and said, I want all of the Great Lakes or Lake Erie cleaned up. I want the, you know, the rivers and the lakes there clean. Uh, there's no need for this pollution. And Udall said, well, look, uh, Mr. President, I'm an interior. We're not the ones that do that in the Great Lakes or the, the river, Cuyahoga River and all. And Lyndon said, God damn it. When I think of dirty water, Stuart, I think of you. Now clean them up. <laughs> but uh, if it goes without saying that um, Stuart Udall, I believe, was the great Secretary of Interior in American history. I put him at number one. But I recently went and saw Ken Salazar, President Obama's Secretary of Interior. I had a couple hours with Ken Salazar at the Interior. We were looking at his paintings and just talking about Theodore Roosevelt. And he called me over and he opened up his desk drawer, Secretary Salazar, and he pulled out a note card like this. He said, when I was chosen as Interior Secretary and confirmed, I got a letter from Stuart Udall on a note card. And on his note card, there, he, Udall told me five things to do as Secretary of Interior. Number three on that five, which he pointed out to me, said, mention Theodore Roosevelt as often as possible. Everybody likes him. The Democrats will applaud, Republicans applaud, and independents will applaud. <laughs> so Secretary Salazar is mentioning TR a lot, and I'm going to go with the Secretary this coming Saturday to, um, to get to accompany him to Pelican Island, Florida, which Theodore Roosevelt saved in 1903 as the first bir federal bird sanctuary in the United States. What was happening in 1903 in Florida was known as the Feather Wars. A group of a, a feather gang, a mob, was um, gunning down with semi-automatic weapons all the migratory birds and seabirds that were nesting in these islets and rocks off of Florida. Meaning, if you were, uh, the egrets and herons would fly south, or trumpeter swans, or whatever it might be, they come to Florida, and these feather gangs would mow them down, pluck out the feathers, steal the eggs, and we were losing all of our bird life from Florida. Keep in mind, in 1903, all of the women in this audience would have come here with a bonnet. And on that bonnet would have been an ornamental feather or a full dead hummingbird. Bird ornament and what in the the fashion industry demanded all these exotic feathers and the birds were going extinct. Now Roosevelt, as president in 1903, was an honorary vice president of the Florida Audubon Society. Theodore Roosevelt's uncle, his father's brother, Uncle Robert B. Roosevelt, wrote a book in the 1870s on the waterfowl of Florida. T.R.'s father was a founder of the American Museum of Natural History. And the great ornithologist, and when President Roosevelt was in the White House, the greatest ornithologist in America was Frank M. Chapman, who grew up around Gainesville and was encyclopedic on the birds of Florida. So in 1903, an ornithologist that was working with the American Museum got a White House meeting with T.R., and he explained to Roosevelt that all of these birds were getting slaughtered in Florida. And Roosevelt turned to a lawyer friend that was there at the meeting and said, what's to stop me from just declaring all this land federal property? And they, they looked at him and said, well, Mr. President, and Roosevelt, in typical autocratic style, said, I so declare it, a federal bird reserve. <laughs> Pelican Island, he appointed a man named Paul Craigle, and if you go to Sebastian, Florida today, you'll see a statue of a man petting a pelican, and you look out on the Pelican Island. Paul Craigle got deputized as TR's first game warden in Florida, and he survived. But out of TR's first four game wardens in Florida, three were murdered. <laughs> and when I'm using the word mafia for these feather gangs, I'm not kidding you. And Guy Bradley famously was an early Autobahner because what Roosevelt was telling Floridians, 
ex-Confederates only a generation or two after the Civil War that the federal government is telling you if you shoot a heron or an egret, it's a federal offense. The answer they got back from Florida to Mr. President, F you. Keep the federal government out of Florida. Who are you to tell us what we should or shouldn't do with wildlife in our backyard? It was states' rights versus the federal government. But the reason President Roosevelt fought so hard for, for wild Florida was birds don't know state lines. You cannot have progressive bird laws in Massachusetts just to have the birds slaughtered in Florida. For you had to have federal laws for migratory birds. And as TR evolved as an Audubonner, he wanted global laws for birds. Because if it doesn't do any good either to save bird life if they go to Central America and get wiped out. Why was TR and Chapman and these guys so worried about the bird life? Well, first off, Roosevelt simply was a bird watcher since his childhood. He grew up in New York, born 1858, had terrible asthma as a boy, and New York factories were just dumping soot in the air. This is pre-Lyndon Johnson's Clean Air Acts by, a, by a, you know, decades. And he had terrible respiratory illness. He only found relief for his lungs when he would go to the Catskills and the Adirondacks. And he started his father, and out of all the president's fathers I've ever read about, I think Theodore Roosevelt Sr. was the best. He homeschooled young Theodore and his brother Elliot, but he took them everywhere in the world and because he was the founder of the Museum of Natural History, he would teach his son, the future president, everything about birds. By the time TR was about 10, he knew all the birds of North America plus their, the, the official Latin name. He started writing drawings of birds, beautiful drawings, modeling off of Audubon and watercolors, and started keeping ornithological notes. In fact, our 26th president's first book he ever published was as an undergraduate at Harvard called The Summer Birds of the Adirondacks. And out of this love of bird watching, and it, it, he evolved into being a bird collector. Now, today when we get animal species, what do we do? You get DNA, and we do videotaping, and we do um, bird banning and we do DNA, I mean, the whole modern bit. Back then, they'd shoot the bird. Because to study, let's just say, the eastern bluebird and how it's different than other, are there other subspecies of bluebirds in the wake of Darwin, you need about 100 bluebirds to study to get variations of traits and, and differences. So Roosevelt starts collecting birds for what he calls the Roosevelt Museum, and he becomes a early and great bird collector, also of nests and of eggs. Um, but he comes back from all these European trips, and I might tell you, T.R., part of his conservationism came out of dismay at Europe. As a young man, he climbed the Matterhorn and saw no wildlife. They had shot up all their game in Europe. He had gone to, to Israel of today, or Palestine, and it was deforested, and people weren't tree planting. He had read Marsh's book about the, what can happen in nature if you, don't, if you don't replenish it. He looked at Greece and Turkey and Italy as having no game laws. And this stayed with him all of his life. But the big thing about that birth date I gave you of TR, 1858, tells you what. He's born around the time of the Civil War. And in fact, Theodore Roosevelt's mother was Southern. She came from Georgia, the Bullocks. And his father was a Knickerbocker, New Yorker. His household in Manhattan during the Civil War was a divided home. Mother pulling for the Confederates, father pulling for the Union Army. Young T.R., with all the fights that he heard with mom and dad, believed that the New Eden the redemption of America was going to be west of the Mississippi River, where all that land rolled, and that the Pacific was going to be the new center of America, 
and our America's eyeballs were going to be looking towards Asia to China, Japan, not Europe. That vision of young TR is as seminal of, of expansionist vision as Thomas Jefferson recognizing the Mississippi River was the spine of America, the middle of America, not the western edge. Now here's young TR growing up with this fervent belief in the western movement. He believes in it because he's reading it in boys' magazines. He starts idolizing anybody with a cowboy frontier um, history. He always cheers for the white hats. He's for Pat Garrett, not Billy the Kid. He's always a cop. He became, becomes a deputy sheriff of Billings County, North Dakota. He becomes police commissioner in New York. Theodore Roosevelt had a vicious prosecu a prosecutor's bent. He liked to bust people. It's an important factor in understanding him busting the plumbers down in Florida and the Agers on behalf of birds. He never had a problem of busting illegal operations. It's what he lived to do. Um, but in the West, growing up in the 1870s, he's, a, he's Harvard class of 1876. Now, what do we know about 1876? Well, Civil War, we're just out of Reconstruction. He majors at Harvard in naturalist studies, which is wildlife biology. And guess who's the king of wildlife in naturalist studies? Darwin. Asia Gray is living in and the great student of Darwin is living in Cambridge. And Darwin, Darwin, Huxley, Darwin's being taught evolution. And part of evolution is understanding animals. And that's what attracts Roosevelt more than anything. He's more of a wildlife person than he is a land person, really. His interest was in the traits and characteristics of critters. And how many we had that were different. And it gets divided into species and subspecies. Famously, T.R. had a debate at the Cosmos Clubs with the most knowledgeable mam mammalologist in the country named Dr. Seahart Miriam. And Miriam, for example, believed we had about nine different types of bear in the United States. T.R. thinks there are five. Miriam's considered a splitter splitting all these subspecies up. TR is considered a lumper who wants less. Roosevelt recognized the difference in bear snouts and things that Miriam was saying as a scientist, but he was worried you guys, the general public, weren't were going to have a hard enough time knowing about your four or five bears, not ten bears. And he was always a big advocate of science equaling public knowledge, not just science for the scientist. So in their great debate, Miriam really won on the facts, but T.R. won on the bluster and was considered the winner of this big scientific debate. But Miriam got the last laugh because about a month later, he goes out to Washington State to what is today Olympic National Park and finds this huge new kind of elk that he's insisting is not different than the Rocky Mountain elk. And it needed a name, and he wanted to call it Roosevelt, Roosevelt Service, named after Theodore Roosevelt, the biggest elk ever found. <laughs> he writes to you, well, I know you don't like all these subspecies, but I think I want to name this one after you. Is that okay? And T.R. writes him back, oh, yes, yes, no bigger honor. Okay, you win the debate. Because he so much wanted to be synonymous, which he is today, the Roosevelt elk of the Pacific Northwest named after him. The problem that Roosevelt sees leaving Harvard, writing that book on ornithology as an undergraduate on the Adirondacks, is that our westward expansion had occurred, but it was really about the geological survey. Everybody going west wanted the west mapped. Land rights, water rights, mineral rights, Where's the gold? Where's the silver? Where's the zinc? Where's the copper? And all of that had been pretty much figured out by the time he graduates 1880s. The West had been mapped because people were looking for money. 
But Roosevelt astutely recognizes what hasn't been done in the West. I mean, in other words, guys, he couldn't be part of the Hayden expedition to Yellowstone. It had been mapped. The geysers had been found. You know, they'd been written about. All the boys' magazines and science magazines and books had come out on all of the West. But nobody had done a biological inventory of the West. Enter Theodore Roosevelt. His whole life is dedicated in this conservationist effort to inventory what we have in this country. What kinds of wildflowers in Texas? What types of, of deer? What types of um, songbirds? What types of prairie grass? He wanted an actual scientific inventory, and he spends his life working to accomplish that. Letter after letter, he writes, Bully, you know, um, we need a local study of, you know, nor this county in, in uh, Arizona, or we need a study of the fauna of Oregon. He, w he loves our country so much that he wants to celebrate our biological richness. That's why he promotes the biological survey, which becomes today's U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And out of Pelican Island, Florida, one I mentioned to you, where now the brown pelican in, at, at the Fine Arts Museum in Houston, this Thursday night is a major ceremony because of the delisting of the brown pelican from the Endangered Species Act because of the conservation efforts to save the brown pelican. And that this is what Roosevelt wanted to do, keep all of our indigenous wildlife. And the, from that pelican island, to save the brown pelicans in particular, the recent pelicans, incidentally, were being slaughtered. Un there were other birds, flamingo, rosette spoonbills, egrets, herons, being killed for their feathers. Pelicans were shot because they were seen as rats to fishermen, vermin because they were so adept at scooping up the fish with those bills and those pouches. I mean, a pelican dives underwater, they come back with a full catch. So the fishermen couldn't stand it, they were competition. So every time they saw a pelican, they'd gun them down. Roosevelt fell in love with the, the pelican. He thought it was one of the most interesting and charming and delightful of all American bird life. And so t you, today you see the pelican on the license plates of Louisiana, for example. That would, have, that would have brought great joy to TR, who liked every state to have an animal to identify itself with. Um, but it isn't about Pelican Island. He then created a string of pearl strategy on Florida. He saved Key West. and He saved the Dry Tortugas, Passage Key. In the middle of the state, Ocala National Forest he creates. He's working to preserve wild Florida and the bird, the second wildlife refuge after Pelican Island are the offshore islands of Louisiana, um, Breton Island. He then goes out and saves the westernmost islands of Hawaii, all of the Aleutian Island chain in Alaska. He creates 51 federal bird reservations all over. Some of these, uh, like the Yukon Delta, are larger than states on behalf of of bird life. The federal government of the United States started deeding land to birds. It was radical back then. Only TR could have pulled it off. Only TR, the political power, and our only by a lot scientist president. We had engineering presidents in Carter and Hoover, but only TR could have pulled out those 51 federal bird reservations and create U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Do you know how many we have today? Over 500 national wildlife refuges in this country because of, it, because of TR's legacy. Now, the other point about Roosevelt's I want you to know as a person he's developing now, his mother, and, who he loved dearly, and his wife, Alice, die the same day in the same house. His wife dies giving childbirth to his first baby, and his mother dies of Bright's disease. He's up in Albany as a reformer state legislator, gets the, a cable from his brother, get to Manhattan fast, mom is sick and your wife's going into childbirth. He takes the night train, works his way through rain, fog, races to the house, and spends an evening, Valentine's Day, going one floor monitoring his wife, down the next floor, back and forth, they both die. 
he has to do a joint burial. They're buried next to each other in Wall Street in the rain. And he takes in his diaries a pen and puts an X across the page and says, my life is over. The light of my is out of my life forever. And he was dealing with deep melancholy and depression. And he, he, his sister worries about him. There is a history of depression in the Roosevelt family. His brother, Elliot, dies of alcoholism due to depression. And she convinces Teddy, or Theodore, to go back to North Dakota. He had made a journey there, fell in love with the Badlands, get out of the game. He punches out and becomes a self-invented wilderness hunter and a rancher and a cowboy and lives in the Dakota territories and is able to find joy in his life again out there. In fact, it's a slogan of the state of North Dakota today. I never would have been president if it wasn't for North Dakota. He actually said that because those people brought him in. When they first came, they made fun of him as being a feat. He was almost blind in his eyes. Later in life as president, he couldn't see out of one eye, completely blind, barely had vision out of the other. You know, the, the dirty secret about TR for all these hunting he did, he was an awful hunter. He couldn't see anything. What he was good at, he had an incredible ear for birds, and he was considered the finest ornithologist of his day for the sounds of birds. A part of it coming almost through blindness, he had developed an over-keen sense of hearing. In fact, he used to tell people he could hear five conversations going on at once, like in a cocktail party. Uh, he had something uh, savant-like quality about him in this regard. And he comes back to New York, and he, sh he creates the Boone and Crockett Club, a hunt club, which is going to create reserves to save America's big game. He ends up creating the American Bison Society. He founds the Bronx Zoo as our first Darwinian zoo where people can come and get interpretations of different wildlife species. And I, he develops a trait that the head of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins, K. Jamison, calls exuberance. Now, exuberance, she claims, is a form of manic depression, and TR is the poster boy of it. Because after the pain of his wife dying and his mother dying and his despair, he never got sorrowful again. He, he adjusted his mind to seeing everything as special and holy. He would be in her, what a joyous auditorium! You would think it's political, just political talk, but he talks that way all the time. Glorious sunset, look at the moon. What wonderful people here tonight. Everything became childlike in wonder. And it's a coping me mechanism for manic depression. And she calls it exuberance. In archetypes for children, Winnie the Pooh, Tigger is the archetype. Jumping into each room. They used to say about Theodore Roosevelt, he was the, the, the groom at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. He'd take over the room with all of this exuberance that he had. And um, so I asked her, well, geez, what's the downside to this? I mean, why is it a manic depression? It sounds like, you know, give me some more exuberance. Who doesn't want it? And she said, it's a gift to be able to do that. And it's largely positive. But the problem is you burn your organs out. And that your, the percentages are sky high for heart attack, strokes, um, and it's true enough, TR never would sleep. He'd write letters up 2 a.m. He would stay up some nights without sleeping for two days straight. The only way he could sleep was through exhaustion. He never drank alcohol except for ceremonial toast, but he drank a gallon of coffee a day. Now, I asked this very smart psychiatrist expecting a big answer, well, what would you modern psychiatry prescribe Mr. Roosevelt, she said, Ambien. <laughs> Seems pretty simple. But back then, he would go on these long hunts, and he'd walk and walk and ride his horse, and he'd work himself to exhaustion. Um, now, famously, when he joins the Rough Riders, you know, here in Texas, he quits Assistant Secretary of Defense ship. I mean, I'm sorry, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Post in 1898 comes to San Antonio. He had been to Texas before 
John, he absolutely loved it, TR. He went wild pig hunting here in Uvalde, Texas with the, the rancher John Moores. They went all the way down to Corpus Christi, and TR kept a lot of notes about the bird life he saw. He got a pig with such big tusk, it became a Madison Square Garden award-winning pig uh, from, that he shot here. He came back and put up a table at the Alamo and recruited the so-called Rough Riders men from Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, the territories, plus some Ivy Leaguers. I don't have time to get into the whole Rough Rider story. I will tell you this is another syn syndrome of TR, that Edwin O. Wilson, our great naturalist at Harvard, says that people like TR are biophilic. They must be surrounded by wildlife and animals all times. In combat, Roosevelt, the Rough Riders, have a cougar, an eagle, and a dog. And as President of the United States, we've been debating whether, what to call the Obama dog earlier this year. He always had six or seven dogs at his side as president. He also had a pet badger named Josiah, which he had raised with a milk bottle given to him by a girl in Kansas. And he used to let it roam around and bite congressmen's ankles. <laughs> they would get startled. They'd come into a business meeting, and there was a badger there that would come in and add like a dog. It would greet them and nip, nip like a border collie. Uh, at the heels of these legislators, and he'd get these hearty laughs out of it. He had two parrots that he kept when he would write at night. He had a menagerie of dogs, um, cats, all, wrote a lot about his cats, uh, garter snakes, bow constrictors. People used to give him gifts of animals. The emperor of Ethiopia sent him a hyena, which he kept at the White House for a while, and it was too difficult, and they donated it to a zoo. Um, so this is a Dr. Doolittle side to TR, um, which it, I, I don't have the time to get into why and how that developed, but he had it since childhood. He was one of those people, some of you might know one of them, that always had these animals running around. You go in their house and it's just overrun. Um, that was Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and the, but after he became a rough rider, he got his battlefield glory on July 1st, 1908. I mean, I'm sorry, July 1st, 1898. On July 1st, 1908, he called it that the crowded hour at San Juan when he won the Medal of Honor for his valor there. He later created literally 100 national forests on July 1 um, to honor this, the, the, um, that, that moment in 1908 to celebrate what they accomplished in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. He gets put in quarantine up in Long Island as for yellow fever. He's now becoming a folk hero. He becomes governor of New York. His first speech, major inaugural speech, is radical conservation. Bottom line, TR is governor of New York. He wants to fire all the politicians from wildlife management because what was happening is people in real estate were getting the jobs or people that were big donors and not scientists. He wanted a bird expert to do the birds, a fish expert to deal with the streams, um, a forestry expert in forestry science to deal with the forest. Modern science brought to land management principles and wildlife protection and management. Um, he becomes vice president with McKinley, and of course McKinley gets shot in Buffalo, and nobody can find Theodore Roosevelt. It's amazing to read the newspapers. Even the New York Times, you can probably pull it up online and it'll say, President lost in the, in the wild. Nobody knew where the VP was. He was climbing the top of Mount Marcy in New York, the tallest peak, which he once said nobody should be allowed to be governor of New York if they don't climb Mount Marcy. And since he hadn't climbed it, he figured he better get it. He had already been governor, so he went and climbed to the top. They, a messenger tells him he's president. He goes to Buffalo, he's sworn in when McKinley dies, and he promises to follow Taft's policies he doesn't. He ushers in a deeply progressive conservation policy that has led to the creation of over 200 million acres of wild America. Um, in 1903 as president, and he famously takes a train trip, and it's the great loop of the whole West, and he brings the naturalist John Burroughs with him to Yellowstone, he goes to the Grand Canyon, stands on the lip, and says, do not mar this. 
Never touch the Grand Canyon. It belongs to our children's children. He goes to Los Angeles and warns them about overpopulation. He cuts through the redwood trees around Santa Cruz, and everybody used to put, put signs on the redwoods, um, you know, Big Ben or, you know, Lazy Larry, and they'd name these big trees. Roosevelt made them all take the signs down that it was desecrating a temple. He uses religious imagery to describe nature constantly, God-ordained. Um, and he is, he is a believer in God and Darwin, because Darwin was made by God, and that Darwin only had come up with a fraction of the answer. Roosevelt and his colleagues were trying to discover what would later become DNA. They, there was a starting to be a belief that we could find the discovery of the makeup of man, and we have just on the very beginning of that journey. Um, but um, he then went and camped famously, which Ken Burns does a lot with in his documentary, camps with John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club in Yosemite, and they sleep out in the snow. Part of that exuberance is T.R. always loving that when he's freezing. You know, it's so wonderful. Wasn't it bully? We almost lost our limbs in the cold. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, and Muir, when he leaves, he goes to Sacramento and sets aside Mariposa Grove in Yosemite Valley, exp expanding the park. He cuts up into Oregon and Washington, and bird watchers are coming to see him. All these Audubon people have realized he's a soft touch. And they're showing him their localized problems, their plights. You know, look what's happening to the, the puffin off of three arch rocks. And Roosevelt's like, well, let's save it. And, he's, he's, and all these bird people and wildlife people are constantly coming into the White House. Um, and he comes back from this trip more convinced than ever and starts creating these national forest parks. But the big thing I want to let you know is he's created the National Monuments along with the Congressman John Lacey, Republican from Iowa. What they do is they use this Antiquities Act of 1906, which they get passed in Congress, which says the president has the right to declare a place a national monument for scientific purposes. Now, the reason for this Antiquities Act, I wrote an article for the Austin American Statesman over the weekend of declaring the the mammoth bones, the Colombian mammoth bones skeletons, 23 of them or something, found in Waco as a national monument. It's five acres. Locals bought a green zone around it. It's 105 acres. That type of site was what the national monuments were for. For prehistoric pottery, relics, dinosaur bones that, you know, you can't just suddenly find a huge tusk of a woolly mammoth or a Colombian mammoth and, you know, steal it off the land or sell it or s ship it to Europe when we're losing our antiquities. Hence, they push that through. Roosevelt sees that he's got an opening. What is science? You know, it's like Clinton's, what is the definition of is is? What is a, a executive order on behalf of scientific lands? Roosevelt loses his battle to save the Grand Canyon in Congress Congress votes to mine the Grand Canyon for zinc, copper, and asbestos. Roosevelt uses the Antiquities Act to put aside 600,000 acres. Today is 2 million acres. People are up in arms. He did it time and again. One reason he was able to get away with it is Arizona was a territory, New Mexico territory, Oklahoma territory, and he didn't have to answer to senators. He got blowback from locals, from gov territorial governors, but those territorial governors were, were appointed by presidents. And that was one of the reasons he tried to save the Smoky Mountains and Shenandoah. He wanted a huge mountain reserve preserved on the east. He could never get it done. If you look at his accomplishment, it's largely west of the Mississippi and then the Gulf of Mexico, Florida, where the blowback wasn't as strong as senators from Virginia, um, you know, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. Wildlife protection. I mentioned birds. The bison I told you he liked a lot about. He eventually ended up raising 17 head, perfect family, genetic line at the Bronx Zoo. Then he got a railroad car and had him shipped to Fort Sill, 
to the Wichita Mountains, and he met with the Comanche chief, Kawana Parker, and he gifted the buffalo back because the natives thought the buffalo had all disappeared. The 60 million had gone down Mount Scott. And now Roosevelt, in a, after the triumph of the West, the eradication of native culture, this was sort of the, supposed to be the bridge building back, bringing back into the fold the gifting of the buffalo back. Today, the buffalo of the Great Plains, if you eat a Ted Turner buffalo burger, you're eating a TR burger. Those are direct descendants of Roosevelt's buffalo that he re started repopulating when a buffalo commons brought back to the Great Plains. Um, the, the other animals' uh, stories of Roosevelt as president, he'd keep his pockets full of nuts and feed the White House squirrels. They'd line up and he'd eat out of his hands. He then bought his presidential retreat pre-Camp David. It was a place called Pine Knot outside of Charlottesville, and it was a rustic cabin with no amenities. And he would go and disappear there. The only guest he ever had there was the naturalist John Burroughs, and he'd go there with his wife, Edith, and Burroughs would come, and they'd go bird watching together. Well, in that house, Roosevelt kept pet flying squirrels. Now, Burroughs, who loved animals and spent a lifetime writing books about them, would cover his head with the pillow at night because of the racket these flying squirrels would make while Roosevelt was up all night. And remember, many people called him Crazy Teddy was up all night saying, isn't this wonderful? Listen to the little buggers and the racket they're making. <laughs> he got into a huge fight with Burroughs over these flying squirrels, and Roosevelt made a compromise. He refused to re evict the squirrels from inside the house, but he said he'd move their nest into his bedroom, not Burroughs' bedroom. <laughs> and he did, and one of them bit him, and he was bleeding terribly from the puncture wound of the flying squirrels and said, oh, look at the little guy got me all joyous about it, and Burroughs decided he was crazy, uh, that he out, was out wildlifing, out animaling Burroughs. Burroughs said, for now on, I prefer to stay at a an inn in Charlottesville. Um, there was a side of lunacy to some of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, his sense of no breaks going forward, his sense of never fearing opposition. He welcomed a fight. He woke up every morning looking to have political fights. And he really had no skeletons in his closet. He had nothing he was trying to cover up or hide. So it made him a very formidable person. And we're very lucky that he adopted onto the, what we call today environmentalism, an early wilderness crusader. And it wasn't just him. It was Muir and Burroughs and, and George Bird Grinnell who ran the Forest and Stream Sporting Magazines, and, and a, a, a generation of people that started saying, we're going to save wild America. If you pull out a Rand McNally map right now and look at all this green, you'd be amazed at Roosevelt's holdings, what he saved. The next great president in conservation after TR. Now, Roosevelt leaves the White House in 1909. The last thing he does 48 hours before leaving is save Mount McKin or, or save the Olympic National Forest. He also saves all these reserves in Alaska. Um, and he then leaves to go to Africa for a year for the Smithsonian Institute. You know, he's there for a year, and Taft, his hand chosen successor, thinks TR was overdid it on conservation, and we're going to roll it back a little, let some logging, let some mining into these Alaska reserves. Gifford Pinchot, the chief forester of TR, was left as a watchdog. Taft fires Pinchot. Pinchot goes over and meets TR in Europe, and it begins the beginning of the Bull Moose Party, of TR creating a third party to break the Republican Party in two, the most popular third party movement in American history, when in 1912 he comes in number two. When he dies, T.R., there is no Mount Rushmore. I don't believe he would have liked that kind of homage to his outdoor life or conservation. Um, but what, he, what the Audubon people did, if you go to his grave in Oyster Bay, he's buried there, and surrounding him, are, uh, are surrounding his tombstone, you can see out in the bay, and it's all now the Oyster Bay National Wildlife Refuge. 
He's buried surrounding by a wildlife refuge, and the Audubon Society runs a sanctuary for animal rehabilitation next to the grave at Young Cemetery, which is a fitting place for, for, for Roosevelt. On his tombstone is just his name and the years of his, of his life, 1858 to 1919. Um, the reason he, when he died at age 60, many, he went to the Amazon and discovered the Rio Roosevelt and contracted a malarial disease, and it wore his body down. It's not amazing that he, he only lived to 60. It's amazing he made it to 60. Ma, uh, there were, you know, and remember, he took a bullet in 1912 in Milwaukee when he ran as the bull moose candidate. This is when he really became a folklore figure when he was shot in Milwaukee, was bleeding, and went on and lectured for as long as I did for about an hour while he's saying, it takes more than a bullet to kill a bull moose. <laughs> uh, you know, at that point, what do you say? <laughs> I mean, it's so outrageous that you can only really salute it. Um, and... Um, but the bullet weakened him and then the malarial disease. He did go on an expedition back to the Grand Canyon. As ex-president, he went and lived with Hopi Indians and, and became a, uh, worked with rattlesnakes and had, would sit in a kiva and the rattlesnakes came all around him and he learned how to keep very zen-like to not jump to have the snakes bite them. He ended up writing an article about the rattlesnakes. He also went back to Florida and wrote about the gopher tortoise. Uh, which interested him and wrote an article for Smithsonian. He would write for science journals on these animals. These were highly sophisticated science and tracks on, on zoology. But after he died, a generation became Rooseveltian conservationist foot soldiers. Um, some of them are, were continued. Gifford Pinchot, a man named William T. Hornaday, wrote this great book, Our Vanishing Wildlife. You ended up having Harold Ickes and Albright and all these guys defining themselves as Roosevelt conservationists. FDR became one. When the CCC is one of the first things that FDR does, Civilian Conservation Corps, that's a page from TR's recommendation before he left office to do the, what he called the Country Life Corps that was going to go and help builds, keep dams and streams and control country life in inventory. Just like TR wanted the inventories of wild America, FDR started doing the WPA guides of inventorying, you know, um, regular America, American counties and parishes and rivers and lakes. And a person in this tradition is Lyndon Johnson. All of you here know how much Lyndon Johnson loved the land. Many of you here no stories about Lyndon in the land. And it meant everything to him, this idea of land conservation. And so you could say that Lyndon Johnson is, is one of the three presidents of the 20th century, TR, FDR, and Lyndon Johnson, that did the most to make our environment that we live in special and healthy. And the difference is it, be, it becomes one of just generations. But basically, Lyndon Johnson is a TR conservationist. Johnson, I'll read you a quote of Lyndon Johnson. Johnson said, The air we breathe, our water, our soil, and wildlife are being blighted by poisons and chemicals, which are the byproducts of technology and industry. The society that receives the rewards of technology must, as a cooperating whole, take responsibility for their control. To deal with these new problems will require a new conservationism. We must not only protect the countryside and save it from destruction, we must restore what has been re destroyed and salvage the beauty and charm of our cities. Our conservation must not be just the classic conservation of protection and development, but a creative conservation of restoration and innovation. That beginnings of restoration was there with TR, with the buffalo coming back, with starting to have wildlife biologists um, and forestry people from Yale Forestry School start training people on how to properly um, manage wildlife and its holdings. And so when the time that 
But National Geographic says Lyndon Johnson was our greatest conservationist president. I would, I would say Theodore Roosevelt was the greatest because he had kind of invented the field of conservation and put that word into our parlance that every one of you here knows it. And today's conservationism is, is also environmentalism. But it's Lyndon Johnson that brought it into the modern context that wanted to make sure that the air that young Teddy Roosevelt's breathed growing up in urban centers wasn't polluted, that made sure the water that people in the West drank um, um, wasn't, wasn't soared with runoff. We wanted to make sure that the trees of our great forest and the Appalachians and the Rockies and the Cascades and beyond would stay rich and thick and wanted to make sure that we never lost the charm of those birds that T.R. loved so much and that Theodore Roosevelt I mean, that Theodore Roosevelt loved so much, but that Lyndon Johnson loved so much in the Texas Hill Country. T.R. knew the state of Texas as well as anybody, and, and he knew that this was Texas, a great place for migratory birds. And I'm not sure if, if Lyndon would have been the great conservationist if it wasn't for Lady Bird and if it wasn't for you all, but he was predisposed to Roosevelt's vision to the land, to the beauty of of keeping America green and passing it on. Because as Roosevelt said, these wild places, we're all all getting older in this audience and nothing's for certain in this world. But we sure like to think that our collective national heirlooms are some of these wild places that we're going to hand down. That someday your great, 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 great grandkids that you'll never know can go to Big Bend or Guadalupe or can, you know, find parts of the Brazos River where they can, or, or they can watch the great migratory birds of Texas, can go to the Gulf of Mexico, and it's not just a, rubbish, uh, a bunch of um, rubbish on the shores. And that's the vision, what I would call, of the Roosevelt-Johnson conservation of the 20th century. And I hope uh, Joseph Califano started a call for this, but I hope all of us will start working to keep Johnson's legacy alive and to start giving Lady Bird and Lyndon the credit they deserve for building on TR's conservation with their new conservationism, which was launched in the 1960s. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I want to ask a couple of questions, and I would like to open up questions to the audience. Uh, but it's been 100 years since Theodore Roosevelt was in the White House. And you mentioned that he has a proclivity for the guys in the White Hats and also for radical policy. If he were in the White House 100 years later today, uh, what would he do with the environmental situation? I know, I, I, as a historian, I don't often do one if, what ifs, but I'm, I've got a big one that because I, I know what TR would do on one issue today. He would not be for drill, baby, drill in the Arctic refuge. It, 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 the Arctic refuge, which the oil industry calls Anwar because it makes it sound like Anwar Sadat and it's in the Middle East. Uh, It is a huge, it's the Arctic refuge. It's our largest wildlife refuge. It is the most untrampled part of the United States. And it is the denning area for polar bear. It's the place of our great caribou herd. And Dwight Eisenhower signed it, the Arctic refuge, as leaving office 50 years ago in in 1960. So it'll be 50 years, the Arctic refuge. Lyndon Johnson did a, put the Wilderness Act into place in 1964 to enhance wilderness status. Jimmy Carter went and further enhanced status. And yet you're getting a movement going on right now to drill for oil in the Arctic refuge. And Roosevelt would sign an executive order that Barack Obama needs to sign, um, which he can do, President Obama has the power to do it, to sign it and put that off limits because 
We've got to say no somewhere. That, it's truly that magnificent of ecosystem up there. Aside from uh, ankle-biting badgers, <laughs> what lessons can Barack Obama learn from Theodore Roosevelt? He can learn from Theodore Roosevelt to be fearless. Um, and, that you, you, when, and that you have to learn the power of the executive order. It was easier 100 years ago to do what TR did. I mean, it was called the executive mansion, and he calls it the White House TR. And he starts, when he gets flummoxed by Congress, he does all these executive orders. Well, look, you can understand if you're President Obama and you've watched what, in his mind, Bush abused executive orders. Why does he want to come in and use them? So I truly believe President Obama wants to be a, a, a healer and bring both sides together. But Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society had, I think it was 67 Democratic senators. Barack's got, what, 60 in Lieberman or 59 in Lieberman? I mean, you know, it's, you're not going to be able to get the legislative things through. So he's probably going to have to, on some key things like the Arctic Refuge, use executive orders. And don't be afraid of them because if you... you you only have to worry about executive orders if you use them for the wrong things. But if you're something right, there is not one single national park that's been created in this country that people say shouldn't be a national park. You'd have, you know, we all applaud it now. Oh, Yellowstone, oh, we love it. You know, Big Ben, we love it. Each of those had localized battles. There's no way 50 years from now people are going to say, oh, Barack should have drilled that Arctic refuge. Not going to happen. So have the, the courage that history will treat it right. On, on issues where you can use executive power. He's worried now about a Democratic senator from Alaska, and he needs that vote for health care. And you can't afford it. And so this political equation going on is much tougher for Barack Obama than it would have been for Lyndon Johnson. Doug, where does Theodore Roosevelt belong in the pantheon of presidents, in your view? Well, I work with Brian Lamb of C-SPAN. Uh, Brian's one of the great... I, my, if I had to pick who's the, my, what I would consider the greatest American... I picked Brian Lamb. <laughs> I love the guy. And he's done such a great job of, he's archiving our country with all of these public policy forms. And it's, it's the end. Um, you know, we, we do a presidential poll, and we usually have, um, which Lyndon Johnson's been rising on every year. But um, number one is Lincoln, number two is Washington, number three is FDR, and usually TR's number four. Truman's been coming in at five, and Johnson's been rapidly um, growing as, as people in this country are looking more at Medicaid, Medicare, um, Civil Rights Act, 64, 65. His legacy's starting to, when you get away from the Vietnam generation a little, Vietnam doesn't dominate as much as some of that domestic agenda. So there's an, a, a, an upward revision going on to Johnson now, incremental but upward. Right. We have questions from our audience? Yes. I just had the joy of seeing Mesa Verde National Park. So what is a TR's take on the Four Corners area from Chaco Canyon? Do we, did he know the ancient people? Yeah, he, uh, President Roosevelt's pushed and signed. It's, uh, it's Mesa Verde is a national, Theodore Roosevelt National Park. The, the impetus for saving the Mesa Verde came from a, a, largely from a women's group of preservationists there. Um, people were stealing, going in, if you don't know Mesa Verde, it's all those cliff dwellings. People aren't sure of them. There's some mysterious aspects to it. The Anasazi Indians and all that were that were that once lived there. And some people think left because of uh, arid conditions. There's other theories we don't have time for. But um, TR saved Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon. Uh, that whole area down there of those places, El Muro and all, which I write about in my book, it was very large on trying to preserve that whole Four Corners area, which I think is one of the most spectacular parts of the United States. Another question? Other question? Yeah. There's a lot of conservation organizations um, in the world. Uh, from a global perspective, which two or three do you think are doing the best job and being the most effective? Mm. Um, the ones globally... Um, the um, Babbitt's uh, running that World Wildlife uh, Fund, which I think does a very good job. I um, mean, I think there's um, um, in the United States. I would. I, I'm very keen on the Wilderness Society, uh, although Leopold and Bob Marshall's group 
uh, created in 1935, which has been fighting for a lot of land policy. But I think we're getting a lot of localized groups, meaning you know, you're having people in Kenya fighting for, for Kenya. What Roosevelt's generation gave the world is how you can save all these places. I think that one of the great things going on now is people looking at international treaties. I mean, Roosevelt leaves office in 1909, 100 years ago, and called for global conservation because pollution doesn't know borders. It does not do us any good to, to keep Rio Grande River clean if Mexico's going to pollute it. It doesn't do Canada any good to keep the Great Lakes clean if we're going to pollute it. So you've got to have these bilateral, trilateral, global initiatives that, um, that they're trying to do on climate in Copenhagen coming up here. Um, but, you know, I think it's, you've got to find the right fit for what your interests are. I've been looking at some local issues that are, there's a group called Louisiana Black Bear Coalition that's trying to get bears back into the South, Mississippi, where you, they used to be thick. I mean, William Faulkner wrote the short story, The Bear, about a bear hunter there, and they used to be all over the Delta, been shot out. It's a subspecies, Louisiana Black Bear. They're coming back. They've now been seen in, in Texas, so we may be getting bear life back here, and it, it adds to, I think, the charm of growing up to know you have animal life in your backyard. Um, you know, I, as a kid, used to thrill at seeing a bear in the Smoky Mountains. You, park vi visitation used to be to see bear. People used to go to Yellowstone and the Smokies to get a glimpse of wildlife in the wild. And, um, and look closely at U.S. fish and wildlife and what they do. Everybody touts the parks because they're so scenic but if you look in Texas, what Fish and Wildlife's doing along the Gulf Coast at some amazing places, we should give these wildlife refuges our support so those are the home bases for animal life. Take Anyone else? one more if there's one, another question. I just wonder, Doug, um, what would, and I know it's difficult to speculate, what would Theodore Roosevelt think of Al Gore? I can't answer that because I don't know about enough about global warming science and, and on that issue. I think the instinct of, of Gore to be a good custodian of the planet, uh, it, it, of course, who doesn't? I mean, you have to be pretty hardened not to support that, but I don't know about the science of it. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I just uh, I plead ignorant on it. All right. Well, I know uh, Harry joins me in thanking you very much for your time tonight and, and a great well, stimulating they, lecture. They, Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Thank you.